everybody. On today's Banking on Innovation podcast, I'm pleased to welcome the CEO of Varo Bank, Colin Walsh. Colin provides some terrific nuggets and wisdom about his experience going from traditional banks to now a challenger banks, how he's had to pivot and adapt the business model, and how he's benefited from having and creating a set of fans and customers that are really engaged in the business model. Welcome to the podcast, Colin. Thanks so much, Jody. It's great to be a guest on your podcast. Thanks. You know, our, our history dates back, well, I guess, over about 15 years ago when we were colleagues in the Consumer Credit Group at Wells Fargo. I hate to admit, but it's actually longer. It's longer than that. There <laughs> you go. I know. quite a bit longer than I know. that, but I, we're going to date ourselves. Yes, there. indeed. So everything is over 15 now. Um, and, you know, yeah. the industry's been through some, uh, I guess, some ups and downs. But I've uh, I've really admired your career journey along the way, and I appreciate you spending some time with us today, sharing your perspective. Well, thank you. Happy to do so. So, Colin, you've had kind of twin experiences of leading large banks from in, in organizations in the U.S. At, at the Consumer Credit Group at Wells, where you were an executive, and then in Europe, where you were an executive at at Lloyd's Bank. So from a macro perspective, perhaps you can just share what are the most significant differences in running yeah, a bank in Europe versus U.S.? Absolutely. Um, and also, you can add in um, the role that I played at Amex, where I oversaw um, you know, markets across Europe. And uh, so I would say that if you take U.K. and Europe um, just in and of itself, there are a variety of different markets. And so you have some that um, have a relatively small group of dominant incumbent players. I'd say the UK is like that, France is like that, um, and you know, not that many smaller institutions. And, and in those, and, and UK in particular, there was a real um, desire on the part of the regulators to introduce more competition and, and try to create more challengers. They were more open uh, in their practices around granting charters to, to help new challengers come into the market and, and bring some competitive forces. And you saw, you see some great examples of that. I mean, Monzo has done very well. Uh, Starling has done well. Uh, Revolut, which has more of a European banking um, license and money transfer license, has also uh, done really well across the continent there. And, um, and then you have other markets that um, have maybe a, a few large banks, but then a long tail of smaller banks. So in Germany, you have the Landes banks. In Spain, you've got the Kasha banks. Um, and actually, more similar dynamics to what we see in the U.S. And I'll, I'll talk about that in a minute. Uh, but also what the consumer needs are are pretty different also. And mm. I think this has been probably an interesting learning for some of the European players that have come into the U.S. and trying to understand how to penetrate that market and uh, with, with mixed results. Uh, in Europe, you, a lot of the kind of challengers get their start by focusing on cross-border activity. Yeah. Uh, so Europeans travel a lot and, and it's, there's a lot of countries in a relatively small landmass. And, and so you see a lot of cross-border activity. You also have uh, within each of these countries and it, it varies country to, by country, but a fairly large underserved small business segment um, that, that absolutely can win through better technology, better user interfaces, better solutions. Um, the underbanked in Europe tends to be more concentrated in immigrant communities and folks that are new to these countries. And, and so that creates opportunity for sure, but maybe a little bit different than um, some of the underserved uh, activities in the U.S., which, again, I'll touch on in a sec. And you also don't see the, the extreme wealth equity issues because there's a stronger social safety net across U Europe. So, so what you've seen with the European challengers uh, in the U.K., across Europe, um, is this kind of opportunity to focus on some of these key needs that, that I highlighted there. Now, the U.S., by contrast, there is a ton of supply, and, and you would certainly know this from your many years in the, in the industry, uh, and you have very entrenched incumbents at the national, the regional, and the local levels. Uh, however, their technology is poor at best, and I think I know you're working hard to sort of bring better technical <laughs> solutions to, to many of these institutions, but it, it puts them at a really distinct cost disadvantage. And so with, with the exception of some of the largest players, 
there's not that much focus on retail mass market consumers. Unfortunately, the economics uh, have become very challenging for many of these institutions. And with even greater regulatory scrutiny now going into charging practices and the CFPB has just recently announced, you know, other areas that they're going to be investigating. Uh, it, it makes the economics challenging for, for many, of, in, many institutions. And so I think what you're going to see over the next coming years is probably some, some banks deciding altogether to exit the, the mass market retail space. Others are looking for partnerships to kind of help them serve that market. Uh, the other the other dimension about the U.S. market, and this is certainly something that was an inspiration for me and my team to create Varo, is this income inequality, these wealth equity issues that are very systemic in this country. And, you know, sadly, the system, for many of the reasons I just mentioned in terms of just the economics, um, has been built predominantly to serve the haves and not the have-nots. And, and people who do not have wealth or high incomes tend to be sort of left to their own devices to figure out how to build good financial health. You know, things like building basic savings habits, uh, being able to build credit or repair credit if you've had an incident, uh, being able to access affordable credit and, and things like fast money movement. And so you've seen a proliferation of solutions in the fintech space trying to meet some of those needs and, and serve what um, it is Roughly, I think the latest estimate is over 60% of Americans, you know, across income ranges claim to be living paycheck to paycheck. And, and that's a real problem uh, that, that needs to be solved. And so I'll talk a little bit more about how we're going about it at Laurel. Wow, what a remarkable set of experiences. And I can see how that's really shaped your, your thinking at Varo. So you talked about the different regulatory environment, let's say competitive environment in terms of the competitive structure some of the the needs that customers have. So how is that filtered down into the different customer experience that banks in Europe are delivering versus what you're seeing in the US? Can you can you talk a little bit more about that? Yeah, sure. So I, mean, I spent you know a good part of my I think of my career in, in chapters, but I'd say the earlier chapters of my career working with these big financial institutions, as you mentioned, you know, Wells and Lloyd's and and American Express. Um, developing and bringing you know what were considered pretty innovative products into the market however they tended to be focused on you know how to get folks on the housing ladder which is great and it's a it's a noble noble cause and a really important one you know how to help folks get the best sort of yield on their savings account but again you know probably focus more on uh consumers that that have money and and that are just trying to kind of get the best guest best return how to create better rewards programs for consumers and you know whether at lloyd's where we we, we uh, took the air mile scheme away from rbs and brought it over to lloyd's and created a, a pretty innovative new product in partnership with both Amex and MasterCard. I mean, that was, you know, at the time, you know, that was actually a really great solution, but it wasn't targeting the kind of the everyday consumer. It was trying to go after people who were really wanting to earn the most air miles. You know, at Amex, you know, we re revamped our, you know, gold card, our platinum card, our centurion card, but, but these were not things that were, were really targeting folks um, with, with, with lower incomes or, or you know, trying to, to survive. And so I think that you see a lot of innovation in that space, you know, again, kind of designed around the haves. Um, and you know, one of the things that really brought it home for me when I first arrived in the UK, you know, the, the regulator, one of the principal regulators, pretty much with the stroke of a pen, eliminated um, uh, and slashed these fees that we could charge yeah. consumers for late fees and other fees. And you know, it took a big slug out of the PL. And, and you know, my team did a great job coming up with ideas that we're going to generate additional income and we're going to help kind of plug that that hole. But when you step back and looked at it, you saw like, wow, like these all of these ideas are like really punitive to the most vulnerable consumers. Um, and so the everyday consumer that, you know, maybe falls one payment late, then suddenly their the APR on their credit card gets hiked up, or you know, they're reversing the order of charges uh, to encourage more uh, insufficient funds income, like things like that. these were daily practices that were happening at the banks. And you know, so you know that I started to think about it and say, well, there's got to be a better way. Now, it wasn't until years later that I actually stepped away from, from um, these sort of big institutional incumbents and created Varo, but, uh, but it really, the seeds of that started early. And so to your question, you know, where do, the, where do these banks focus, you know, whether it's in Europe or in the US, it tends to be much more around 
folks that are more established. And uh, when when the bill comes due for you know hitting the PL numbers and all the rest of it, unfortunately, um, the folks that end up paying for that tend to be consumers that are much more vulnerable. And and you know, I'm glad to see the regulators, you know, cracking down on some of this. And and we ourselves, as well as other fintech competitors, have been really pushing on this to eliminate overdraft fees and other types of fees that are that are quite punitive to, to consumers who who need the help of the financial institution probably more than anyone else. Yeah, Varo is one of the one of the leaders around this. And you can see how the entire North American industry, banking industry, is going through and adapting to this process. And there's there's more to come in terms of the, for the sure, changes. For sure. Yeah. And so uh, we're, we're going through this uh, this set of decisions and how to how to create not just better experiences, but also overcome some of the economic hurdles that that some of the regulatory burdens are going to have. You, you you alluded to the fact that, look, you were in amazing executive positions at these big banks, and you could have continued down that path. But you chose to take this leap and start Varo. So what was behind that? What was the event or the, you know, the, uh, the, uh, the, the epiphany that you had that, that caused you to do that? Or was it just a, a buildup over time where you said, this is the right time to, to do something yeah. different? Probably more the latter and, you know, kind of getting that itch. And also, you know, when you've been at something for a very long time and you sort of look at, okay, now if I don't do it now, I'm never going to be able to yeah, do it right. sort of thing. So, you know, what it felt like. I have that feeling all the also, time, by the way. So, yeah, 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 I, I'm sure. Well, you know, and you also, you know, you, you I think when you know, I coach of fellow entrepreneurs and people who are thinking about starting businesses, you sort of go through a bit of an arc in your life where in the early stages, you know, you can afford to make mistakes and, you know, you can do something, it might not work out and, you know, so be it, you sort of pick yourself up and you go get another job and you, and you move on. Um, and then in the middle of your life, when you have all these sort of like responsibilities and commitments and you're trying to build sort of a little bit of a security, it, the risk factors are, you know, it, it's more daunting, the idea of actually taking big risks. But then you get to a place where it's like, you know what? If, it, if you try something and yeah. it doesn't work out, you're, you're, you're not, you know, you're going to be okay. Yeah. And you can, you can kind of figure that out. And so, so I kind of reached that point mm. where I felt like, okay, you know what? I'm going to take bigger swings here and I'm going to try something that, you know, maybe it'll fall flat on its face or maybe it's going to be hugely successful. And, and I feel that, you know, with a lot of uh, determination and conviction around the problems we're solving, um, we've come a really long way. I think probably further than, than many others that, that have attempted in this space. And, and, and I'll talk a little bit about why, because, you know, I felt like that this this system was pretty broken and that in order to bring real financial inclusion and bring financial opportunity to what was really a growing group of consumers that that were living paycheck to paycheck that were trying to get ahead in many cases striving to get ahead but found themselves stretched they needed better solutions, smarter, faster, safer platforms that could help them build confidence, could ultimately transform their daily relationship with money. And, and that, you know, the, the idea of creating a platform and creating a bank that could do that mm -hmm. uh, was super exciting for me and certainly for the team that's and the investor group that, that have uh, been with us from, from the start. Not, I, I can go deeper into that and talk a little bit more about what that means in practice. Yeah, one gets the sense that, uh, and, and hearing you speak, of course, it's very inspiring, but that Varo is very purpose-driven. And in fact, you, you talk about mm -hmm. changing the way that customers bank and the way they feel about money. So say, say, say more about that. How does that actually work out in practice? Yeah, so internally, we like to talk about, you know, we've built a lot of really interesting products and features, but we don't want to be just a feature shop. Mm. What we're trying to be is more of almost like a financial operating system for our customers and thinking about the very specific sort of jobs to be done in their lives. Like they're trying to um, move money quickly. They're trying to build savings habits, trying to build credit, access credit. And again, this idea of creating this smarter, faster platform gives better access to credit, gets better access to um, higher yield savings. Um, and integrated in a wrapper, all in one app, is what, we, what we've been building. And all the pieces have been coming together. And, and the other piece of the story that I think is really important is we made the decision very early on that if we were operating as a real bank, as yeah. a chartered institution, 
um, we would be able to do this in, in a much more sustainable way in terms of, you know, because you really do have to innovate across many sort of products and use cases. Um, and you're quite inhibited when you're in a sponsor bank relationship. We can talk more about that too, because the, the, a lot of those um, relationships are falling under even more intense scrutiny sure. and, and becoming even more challenging. When, when we, you know, we partnered with the bank core initially, but we said from the beginning, we, we our, our aspiration was to become a chartered institution. And the other piece of that is it, it offered, and I, and I feel it today, and we hear it from our customers, you know, there's a level of legitimacy and credibility that comes with being a directly regulated bank yeah. and sort of having the full stack. Um, and so, you know, so what does it actually mean for customers? So, you know, we have smart saving solutions where they can set up, you know, savings um, sort of options in the app where they can save their pay, they can save their change. We were very clear on how much they have to deposit to get access to the 5% APY, which is still a market leading savings rate. We help our customers trying to maintain positive cash flow, which is really the kind of precursor to any real well solution, both through our savings tools, but also giving them access to things like short term credit. And we have now borrow advance up to $500 where you can get an instant advance if you need it. Uh, if there's an unexpected expense, we're uh, working now to actually provide even higher levels of credit for customers that are building a relationship with us. The, but you know, these are low cost, often short term loans to help people make ends meet or cover unexpected expenses. We also know that money movement is incredibly important, particularly to consumers that are living paycheck to paycheck. So we've been innovating over the years, first creating the borrow to borrow, which is free instant money movement within our ecosystem. When we became a bank, we started to offer Zelle and that had the benefit of not only being able to send money free and instantly, but also receive money. So, you know, many of our customers are, you know, they're, they're sort of the backbone of the country. These are people that are, you know, it, working in in homes, doing lots of different things. They're maybe trainers at the gym. They could be people working in, um, you know, salons. They could be people working at Walmart and Amazon, you know, people that are driving for Uber. But, you know, now suddenly people could get paid by Zelle, like money could come in through Zelle. And so, so, you know, when we first started working with them, they were talking about, well, you can use it to pay your dog walker. I'm like, well, our customer is the dog walker. <laughs> and and then now they can be paid by Zelle and now they can t enjoy all of the benefits yeah. that, that uh, our platform has to offer. And then we recently launched Borrow to Anyone, where now mm -hmm. our customers can safely and, and with no cost, be able to send money to anyone in the U.S. that has a debit card. Um, and so that's been, been going very well for us too. And it continues to to ramp up as customers realize that wow this is you know a safe system it's on a yeah. secure set of rails this is a regulated institution um a, a couple other areas that that we've been focused on is credit and repairing credit building credit credit, we offer the Borrow Believe secured credit card that doesn't require setting aside a large deposit, which is also a real impediment for folks that want to use a secured card. And there are no fees because many of the other uh, options that are available have, have a lot of fees associated with them. And so this has been hugely impactful for our customers and seeing their credit scores going up. Um, and then most recently, and you may have seen this and you may not have, but we were the first a U.S. bank to offer free uh, tax preparation and filing through our app in partnership with Column Tax, mm. and um, that's something that you know helps save time uh, and it saves a lot of money for our customers who have to go who might otherwise be going to one of these tax services, um, and they get their taxes uh, five days early. They can put use the Borrow Believe card when the uh, funds come in to help improve their credit. They could put the money in the high yield savings account. So there's lots of options that, that are created with Borrow. And, and that has been hugely popular since we went live with that. Um, and the IRS literally just opened the doors, I think, on Monday. But we've had customers starting to file weeks ago um, when we uh, when we first mm. made the service available. So all of these things are, you know, how do we pull them together in a fully integrated single app experience that simply allows our customers to live their lives on, on our platform and see themselves getting ahead. And that, that's the part that is certainly the most rewarding for me. And, you know, uh, I, I like to say that, you know, when we hear our customers asking themselves and asking others, you know, why are you not aiming for more? Why are you sticking with these legacy institutions that are not helping you get ahead? just join Varl. Well, when that conversation takes off, then I'll say, okay, Jody, then it's been a job well yeah, done. Yeah. Yeah. Well, what an impressive set of capabilities um, that, and I know you're, you're 
delivering that uh, message more broadly. And you've talked about, and I've heard you talk about creating, you know, a different kind of engagement with customers to help them manage their banking. It sounds like this is all coming through as part of this, what you just articulated as, you know, as a financial operating system that's helping mm -hmm. them improve and better manage the different aspects of, of their banking life so they can really focus on, you know, the things that they love to do or want to do. Is that part of the, the engagement that you're really trying to drive? A hundred percent. And then building tools that help customers understand in really simple ways how to unlock the benefits mm. and what are those kind of steps that they have to take. And that's part of the engagement as well. Is so, you know, we've now gotten to a level of scale where we have a lot of customers that show up on our front door every day yeah. and then helping them understand how to take advantage of sort of the richness of the of the platform that we've built. Yeah. And and also, you know, it's combining a little bit of the kind of innovation of a tech company, because like a lot of us at Varro consider ourselves a tech company, but also the the nimbleness uh, you know, that that brings, but also the security and trust of a fully regu regulated financial institution, because we're also a bank. And so, so these are, this has been, I'd say when I look back at my entire career, this has been certainly the most interesting sort of cultural experiment yeah. in terms of how you bring together yeah. the the folks that have spent their whole lives in you know fast moving technology companies that just want to build really innovative things alongside folks that spent their entire lives inside banks that understand that you have to have a very effective risk management program yeah. you have to understand the control environment you have to remain compliant you have to look out for customer outcomes and so trying to mesh those two has been exciting and, oh. and I feel that we're, we're driven by a common, you know, and joined by a common purpose and, and a belief that we can make this system better. Mm -hmm. But, you know, the day to day on the ground, you know, some people are just wired differently. So you have to spend more time, you know, creating that context and focusing on collaboration. But I think the cultural aspects have been as interesting and rewarding for me as just building out the, the, the platform itself. Fascinating. You know, I, I can, I can tell by what you're, you know, how you're conveying it, that there was a lot of pieces of knowledge and capabilities that you, that you of course acquired along the way, but there's really not a specific blueprint for what you're trying to do at Varo. I mean, you are bringing together a lot of experiential knowledge and tapping into expertise of, you know, various leaders throughout the company, but you are building a kind of a different blueprint here. Uh, I, I, I'm laughing only because I say this to my team all the time. Like there is no playbook right? Right. for what we're doing yeah. is, you know, we're trying to figure it out in the best possible way and do the right things every day for our customers, you know, in terms of for our people, for our investors um, and creating something that can really transform this industry. And that that is something that it's a deeply held belief that it needs to change um, and that we have sort of the core you know, foundation to actually make that change happen, you know, but if you step back and think about, um, you know, just even the last 10 years where there's been a proliferation of fintech apps and experiences, yeah. you know, the reality is that the, the bulk of the sort of consumers, even these paycheck to paycheck consumers, which is a massive TAM. I mean, we estimated at about 180 million consumers that could potentially be in this TAM, the bulk of them, 80. 5% are still with the incumbent institutions. And so you ask yourself why, you know, and, and it's because until now, I don't think there's been a solution that is rich enough to sort of encourage that sort of mass switching behavior. But I do feel we're getting much closer. And as the incumbents get under even more pressure in terms of how they're going to serve this customer base, and you know, you now have players that have been investing in capabilities for an extended period of time, you know, it's going to be very exciting, I think, over these next few years to start to see what customers ultimately do and, and do they make the decision to start start uh, looking for these alternatives and switching. Yeah. And so, I mean, you do have some players that, that have achieved a reasonable amount of scale, but it's amazing how many have not. And, and so I think that where we're very much focused is understanding deeply the needs these customers have and using technology and banking together to come up with solutions that, that are going to be unlike anything uh, consumers have seen. But there is no, I wish there was a playbook. Yeah, Some days nice. I wish I could just go and, could... and reference like, okay, what do you do at this juncture? Exactly. I have a little secret playbook. Well, I think the sweet yeah. irony of this as well is, uh, I think you're right. We do share kind of a common you know purpose, uh, Varo, as well as Personetics. You're trying to do it through... Uh, 
through a, a you know a, a challenger institution we in our own way are trying to move the entire industry forward in this direction which is to be able to better understand customers help them make better decisions show them that you're on your side on their side and by the way you can have strong economics as part of that as well and i think that's where it's uh of course it's more challenging to figure out that path sometimes it's easier yeah, sure. like it's easier to consider some of the things you talked about traditionally which is okay we can introduce this kind of fee or you know this kind of penalty that uh that may not be you know as as visible but there's well, there's a much and, greater opportunity in terms of the creating relationship depth and loyalty if you can think about that differently well, and I don't want to put you on the spot because I know many of your clients are the incumbent institutions, but like having come from that world, you know, I feel like I have a unique perspective on, you know, there was a lot of profiteering on hardship yeah. that like, you know, when you do, when you do this from scratch, yeah. you know, I, I often say like a new build is a lot easier than a renovation. I mean, I spent years inside these big institutions yeah. trying to like, you know, drive change, yeah. drive innovation. And when you're doing it from scratch, you don't have any of that sort of legacy conflict because, yeah. you know, I experienced it at Wells, like when we built the, the home equity internet business, which you, I think you ultimately uh, became the beneficiary of that, you know, there was lots of conflict inside the branches where they're like, how can you do this? Like my bankers aren't going to get credit for these loans. And like, I spent incredible amount of time and energy in those early days as this thing was scaling up, trying to help resolve some of that internal channel conflict. Like you have none of that when you start from scratch, right. you know, you just can focus on the, the problem you're trying to solve for the customer. And the other thing that I think is really unique unique and, and, and will become more apparent in time is just how tightly integrated the value proposition is because of our tech platform, the way we've designed mm. it, the way we use our data, the way we've really managed the customer journeys, and that it's not like a checking account and a savings account yeah. and a credit account. Like it's all part of a singular experience. And, and as customers engage with us, they learn how to take advantage of all of that. And their everyday banking is what we're using to determine what their eligibility for more credit. So it's not like we're sitting, you know, we've got a credit business that's sitting off in the silo. Oh, no, we've got to make good credit decisions. And as we've been extend, extending our lending, our, our losses have actually been coming down. So we've, we've been able to use this information in a more sophisticated way, looking at the holistic relationship to get great performance there, but also drive the flywheel effect of engagement with our customers. Because one of the things that, you know, when you look at this, the customer group that we serve, you know, being able to get access to transparent, affordable credit, there's a high need and a high demand for that. And, you know, many of the banks don't even approach that market. And we've been able to do it in a cautious, prudent way, build the more sophisticated models and, and operating platforms to help us be able to satisfy that need. But that also drives massive amount of engagement around the core banking product as well. Mm. And so we have the benefit of not just having this sort of interchange only business. We have an interchange plus lending plus payments and, and, and a number of other sources of sort of rich monetization, which ultimately impacts our unit economics. So it yeah. keeps our investors happy. And when you look at just the path since we've become a bank and the levers that we've been able to pull through a very difficult economic period where, you know, we had to cut way back. Yeah. We were spending a ton of money right. on marketing and all of that, like, like everybody else. I mean, you just have to, you know, shift your focus from grow at all costs to capital preservation. But, but we did sustain investment in building out a differentiated product and getting smarter about how we acquire customers. And so we're now in this really exciting kind of rescaling phase, but at like a mm. fraction of the acquisition cost because of some of the steps that we've mm. taken. That's really exciting. And uh, you talked about a number of different levers that you're pulling now, which are actually quite different than you were, let's say, even two years ago. In fact, the last time we met, we were at the, the Second Curve Bank CEO mm. conference with about 70 bank CEOs and a, and a few other uh, people as well. And I really admired how you talked about um, extensively the importance of acquisition economics. You talked about it at a level that most mm -hmm. CEOs don't get to, right? So I just want to replay a little bit of that and get your reaction. You know, and, and the tone was very different, let's say, even than just a couple of years ago when it was all around growth, right? Customer growth mm -hmm. was, the, mm -hmm. was the primary metric. This was much more about you talking about changing the ac acquisition economics and doing things around optimization of your algorithms and things mm -hmm, like that mm -hmm. that'll drive benefit. And now you've just talked about also 
additional ways to drive revenue through additional levers as well. So tell me, how did that, how did that change come about? And tell, say a bit more about how you've optimized the acquisition economics. Sure. So, so uh, necessity is the mother of invention. <laughs> exactly. so when, you do, when you eliminate most of your marketing expense, you have to get clever yeah. around how you're going to continue to grow. And so, so I think we we took a step back and said, okay, you know, there's a, a set of core channels. I mean, organic is obviously the most important, and you want to continue to speak to an audience that you know loves your product emphatically. They want to tell other people, you know, they're coming to your site or your app, and and they're and they're taking your product. And so, so we doubled the size of organic just by continuing to invest mm. in our product. So then you say, okay, and then, you know, kind of adjacent to organic are referrals. So people who love your product are going to tell other people about it. And if you give them a little bit of an incentive, then they're even more likely to tell other people. So, you know, we continue to grow that. Mm. So that was fairly low hanging yeah. fruit, let's say. You know, we also have in our app, you know, a pretty rich marketplace of partners that offer everything from, from job services to, um, you know, investing to a variety of different things that are kind of insurance. We've got a bunch of insurance players that are inside our app. And so we have reciprocal sort yeah. of distribution arrangements with some of those folks as well. And so that's also a source of acquisition, not, not a huge source, but it is a source. And then the really scalable, but very challenging and expensive channel is paid. Yeah. And so, Initially, we sort of dialed our paid way back. So, you know, I told my team, like, you know, don't keep making Mark Zuckerberg richer, <laughs> you know, as we're trying to figure out how to preserve capital. Yeah. And so, you know, we pulled out of a lot of that activity and just focused on getting smarter in search and how to focus on keywords that, you know, showed high intent for customers. Mm -hmm. But then we built, and this is, I think, what, what I may have mentioned at that conference, we started building predictive algorithms. So we we have inside of Varo, um, you know, our best customers, we consider our North Star customers. And so we started building machine learning algorithms to help train the, the big ad platforms, how to find us those mm -hmm. customers. And so instead of just spending a lot of money and looking at a top of funnel metric, we were building these tools to predict who is most likely to become the best customer. And so then we were able to start scaling up and then go back into Facebook and other of these big ad platforms at a fraction of the cost in terms of what it was. I mean, we were really starting to get very deliberate around understanding the switching intents. So was somebody coming because they wanted a high APY? Were they coming because they wanted wanted a, you know, a, a no fee bank account where they coming because they wanted access to credit and you know, so on and so forth. So really understanding those intents and then really using the algorithms to, to match those intents with the product experience when they arrived. And so, so it's been, you know, it's been a journey, but we've, more than doubled our acquisition just in the last six months at a fraction of the cost. And the other piece, which is now uh, starting to grow pretty quickly, are building features that have inherent network effects. So I talked a little mm. bit about borrow to anyone. And so when I send you money, I can send you, you know, $10, $20, $100, whatever, Jody, you know, we went out to dinner and I'm going to pay you, pay my part of the bill. You know, you get that you know, immediate that text message or email from me saying, okay, I'm paying you back. And you have the option to take the money into your debit card or open up a VARO account and learn about what VARO can offer you. And it's take two minutes to mm. open up a new account. And so we're finding that many of those customers are saying, oh, this is interesting. This is kind of a new kind of a bank. And so, so we're, so that is that scaling and, you know, sort of displacing cash app and other ways that our customers were sending instant money transfers. It's introducing borrow to whole new audiences of customers. And so I can't say too much. There's a lot more on the horizon on that front, but, but really finding innovative ways to reach customers and to scale with, with very positive economics. And then on the other side, if you want me, to, want me to go into the sort of the monetization levers, you know, one of the things that, you know, didn't really require any effort on our part, but like but the Fed was incredibly helpful is that they raised interest rates. And so mm -hmm. we were sitting on a lot of deposits mm -hmm. that we suddenly were making a spread on. So that was something that was a little bit of a, you know, a nice, nice to have that just sort of as the rate cycle was going up and we didn't have a huge lending book and, and we had deposits to fund our lending. So unlike non-bank fintechs that had to go and source expensive funding to support their lending portfolios, you know, we had deposit funding. So then we were able to start to, you know, with the right models and tools in place and the products in place start to scale up our lending activity. So we're monetizing our deposits, we're expanding our lending, we were innovating in the payment space, all of these things enabled by, um, by having this charter. And so the decision to, you know, get that charter, I think has proven very fruitful for us. 
Really remarkable uh, learnings and the way that you've adapted and pivoted the model. I, I do want to underscore some of the things you said because I think it's really important for our, let's say, marketing friends in the audience, which is around, first of all, on the earned media. And it sounds like you really tried to double down and optimize earned media, first through you know, organic search optimization, then through um, cross-linking, then also through referrals. And even I'll say, even in your your uh, your network product network effect is kind of a, mm -hmm. a form of earned media. And then on the paid side, I love what you said, which is if you're not optimizing for paid, then you're basically making you know Zuckerberg rich. But That's you right. can optimize for paid if you really are get diligent around it and focus on your customers and help the networks with your algorithms. Then you can do things that are profitable for your company as well. And I think it's a it's a really important marketing message uh, because, you know, so much comes down to uh, certainly for for Varo and for others, really understanding the the unit economics and your customer acquisition costs. And can you make that more favorable? Well, and let's face it, these last two years have been brutal for many companies yeah. that are not, you know, that have not scaled, that have not reached profitability. And, you know, investors have just sort of closed the book and said, we're not going to put money in these companies. Yeah. And so, so it's really become quite existential. And then you have others that, you know, have sponsor banks being served with consent orders, and that's slowing down the pace of innovation in terms of the new products that they can offer. So, so it's been a, it's been a really difficult couple of years for uh, for our industry at large. And so, you know, our ability to kind of hunker down and, you know, leverage the assets that we've built, you know, kind of leverage the sort of, the, the can really capture the energy and enthusiasm and determination of the team that wants to change the industry to just keep pushing and building product features that customers love. You know, our NPS is just off the charts. I mean, we have like a plus 80 NPS, wow. you know, for our category. Yeah. I mean, I remember I don't know what our NPS was at Wells and Lloyd's. And I mean, it's just off the charts. Yeah. And But customers are really fanatical about the product experience mm -hmm. once they start to engage with it and understand all the benefits and they can see how, like whether their credit score is going up, all of a sudden their lending limits have gone up, their savings, or they're earning, you know, this, this high interest on savings. It's super easy to send money to anyone. Like all of these pieces are working in tandem to kind of help the customer achieve these better outcomes. And so, so again, and I also, I look at it as still early innings. I mean, of we've course. got a bunch of stuff. I mean, just, yeah. just, you know, just, just watch the space because we've got things rolling forward over these next, uh, next number of months that are going to be pretty exciting. Yeah. Well, I know one of the things that you've really brought is this focus on different levers in the business and understanding which are the ones that you should, you know, address at what times. And you talked about a lot of them. Anything else that you can share around, you know, what's coming in the future? What are the other levers that you think the bank needs to be able to address or pull to drive either around acquisition, retention, loyalty, deepen, deepening of relationships? So I would say, you know, when I think about you know the journey we're on you know we're 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 definitely ticking the acquisition box and 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 learning how to cost efficiently acquire customers i think we're starting to take the engagement box in terms of how to get those customers when they show up to really understand and appreciate and engage with the product i'd say the next area that we're putting a lot of attention to is uh, just continuing to um drive you know just ongoing um, lifetime value with customers okay. and sort of the stickiness of those relationships. So, you know, I talked about our North Star customers who are, you know, very sticky. They're very engaged. They're putting more and more of their paycheck. You know, I think in, initially with a lot of these neo banks, you saw, you, and I think you still see this, particularly where there's not a rich enough product proposition is sort of a pocketing behavior where people will take one out and they'll, you know, if they're working two jobs, they'll use it as yeah. a way to kind of have extra money for spending money, or they'll use it for, you know, paying certain types of bills. And, and so I think there's a lot of prevalence of this sort of pocketing behavior. And so for us, it's really about how do we now get customers to use us as their primary bank. And we see very differential yeah. engagement, retention, um, and economics associated with folks that are that are using us as a primary bank. They're paying their bills with us. They're you know putting all their their paycheck into into Varo and using the full suite of services. And I think that's an area that like really um, getting best in class in that area will just keep making this even more eye watering from an investor perspective because you just see the the lifetime value of those sticky relationships and the monetization potential. I mean, and as we talked about, I mean, you and I've been doing this for a long time and I've been inside a bunch of financial institutions and I have never seen the level of uptake when we introduce a new product 
um, in, in any of the previous mm. institutions that I work for. Mm -hmm. So when Varo launches something new, we see like just massive engagement from our customers. And these are customers that we've already sunk the acquisition costs. So, so if I want to introduce a new lending product, I want to introduce some new form of product, I don't have to reacquire that customer. It's just simply about giving them something that they need that's going to be valuable in their lives. And again, going back to that point around, we just want customers to live their lives on our platform and just keep providing them with the tools and the, and the services that are making their lives better. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's uh, it's admirable how you've created that that trust, which is showing up in your NPS scores, not just in your comments. So For that's, sure. uh, that's great to see. Well, I often say, yeah, the, the business we really trade in is trust at the end yeah. of the day. And, you know, people are, are trusting us with their money. Yeah. So, Colin, the entire industry is also evolving, not just from a regulatory aspect and certainly, you know, there's there's cost pressures as well. But there's uh, there was also some recent uh, regulations around 1033 and open banking. And so that's mm -hmm. planning to take effect, let's say, probably sometime in 2025. How mm -hmm. well do you expect Varo to be positioned as the U.S. embraces open banking like it's been done in other markets? How well do you think Varo is positioned there? Well, let me just start with, you know, I've been involved in this debate <laughs> and conversation for a long time. So I was in Europe when we were doing the initial PSD2 um, you know, regulation on open yeah. banking, you know, it was uh, very engaged in comment papers um, at, at the European Union level and so on and so forth. So I've, I've seen this in action. And, you know, I think the Europeans took a more prescriptive approach to laying out a regulatory framework that the financial institutions had to adhere to. I think it's produced mixed results. I mean, the U.S. had been a little bit more hands off. Uh, but, you know, I actually do think some more clarity and guidance on the part of the regulators will be helpful. Um, and so I think when you look at sort of where Dodd-Frank um, Section 1033 is going, um, I think it has, you know, there's still, still some work to be done, but I, I think the general framework is is heading in the right direction. And as a first principle, you know, myself and my team, you know, we believe very strongly that the consumer has the right to be in control and own their own data and be able to provide permission institutions to provide access to their data if it's going to offer them a solution that's going to actually help them. Um, and I, But I also think that there needs to be checks and balances in place. And this is, I think, part of why 1033 was put in place or is, is, is coming into place to avoid sort of anti-competitive behavior because you do have entrenched competitors that, you know, we're very much pushing to kind of own the pipes around who could access and mm -hmm. they could shut them off or they could determine what data could be shared. Yeah. And, and that, that is kind of anti-competitive. And so I think that, that it's important that if we agree on the fundamental principle that the consumer should be able to control and own their data, then you really don't want to have um, somebody sort of saying, yeah, well, that's great in theory, but I'm going to actually make the decisions on whether you can share that data or not. Yeah. And so, so I think that it does sort of create a little bit more of a level playing field. Um, you know, I also think that there, we're still in early days in terms of truly understanding where the liability sits when something goes wrong. So there's a number of players in the ecosystem. Yeah. You've got the consumer, you've got the financial institutions, you have the data aggregators, and you, we really haven't seen any really high profile <laughs> events of where things have gone terribly wrong. And then who who is ultimately going to be be responsible? And so there's things around you know whether it's consumer privacy, permissible permissible use of the data, um, and do, are they being use it for good purposes or bad purposes, or are they creating customer harm? So I think there's there's work to be done to flesh that out. But Varo, I think is going to hopefully be on the forefront of trying to help shape some of that debate. We've been an early advocate of open banking. We've allowed our customers to share data, link accounts, you know, link their VAR account, as well as linking other third-party accounts to help support money movement, help our customers gain a view of their full financial picture and make some of the features that we've been building uh, even more effective for our customers. So, so I, I, I'd like to think that we'll continue to play an active role in this as it evolves, but it is certainly something to keep a close eye on. Yeah, yeah, it's a very exciting space. Uh, and, and I agree that the combination of, let's say, market plus regulatory factors is probably what's needed to kind of push this forward, not just with pace, but also with some clarity and, uh, and you know, with the, with the right kind of posture so that, that people are protected, but they're also empowered customers empowered. And I think, think of it from a policy and a principle perspective without necessarily being overly prescriptive. Because I think where things yeah. went a little bit 
wrong in Europe mm. is the regulators got a little bit too prescriptive right. on the solution. Right. Um, and so there may be, you know, ways for the industry to solve for that within, within a policy framework. Yeah. Yeah. Well, let me, let me go in a slightly different direction here. And I hadn't talked to you about this before, but you know, one of the things that, uh, that I feel the industry should move more towards is it's what I'll call evidence-based marketing which is that as you promote a certain solution or an offer to a customer, know them well enough to inform them, this is how that will, they will benefit from this offer. So if you want to move them to a mm -hmm. new credit card or into a different deposit product or a checking product, based on their transaction activity and the behavior that you've seen, show them how much they'll benefit. And mm -hmm. I think that even directionally, if we can partially move in that direction, then it'll create this dynamic where customers are really starting to trust when a, when their bank partner suggests something for them that is mm -hmm. with their best interests in mind. Sounds like that's something that you've tried to kind of build into the to the Varo experience, but I, I see the potential for the entire industry there as well. Yeah, it's very much in our DNA. And you know, one of the things we started to do a number of years ago is start to measure impact. So understanding you know, how many people can we help start forming savings habits? How many people can we help improve their, um, their, their credit ratings? Mm -hmm. How many people can we you know, kind of lower their cost of, of participating in the banking system? And, like, and, and being able to quantify that and be able to articulate to consumers. And so it's, I think it's very akin to what you're saying. And, mm -hmm. and you do see now, I don't know if you're familiar with, there's now a new division within Consumer Reports that's looking at this sort of thing in the financial space, trying to rate, and it's rating institutions on, you know, are they doing what they say? You know, you also have obviously regulatory, um, you know, rules around things like UDAP and other things that they're saying, you know, you can't be misleading or deceptive. But I think this takes this a whole nother level, which is, you know, to me, that's table stakes. You don't want to, I mean, you're not going to have trust if you're trying to do deceptive marketing. But but if, you, if you're now focusing on a much higher level of trust in terms of being able to demonstrate an outcome that you can achieve by utilizing a particular product or service. To me, that's a, that's a win-win all around. Yeah. Well, for our last question, I feel like you, you've you responded to it in a few different ways, but let me ask, uh, ask it uh, to, to wrap us up here. So what do you think customers will expect from the industry in the next three to five years that the industry is not well prepared for? Yeah, well, <laughs> there's a long list of things, but <laughs> but I, I, you know, I think that you know the the experience of just real time, you know, being able to uh, whether it's accessing credit, whether it's you know getting solutions that help you on some of, so many of these fundamentals. It could be savings, it could be investing, it could be payments. But and this is where I think the evolution of AI and machine learning capabilities um, are are going to create much more highly personalized experiences. And I know that's certainly something that you and your company have been working on and providing better insights and tools for customers to be more empowered and be more in control of their financial lives, but also just eliminating a lot of friction um, in terms of how to get to what you need to get to. You know, the, the, the people don't want to spend their whole lives thinking about their banking, you know, and, and money is an integral part of how we live our lives. And so having all of that work seamlessly in a highly integrated way, in a way that actually you can trust and you can feel that you're actually making meaningful progress and achieving the outcomes you're trying to achieve in your life. I mean, that to me is the, is, is the, the space that we're headed. And, and I think that it's going to really shift the, the curve on consumer expectations. So if an institution is not providing that, I mean, I look at some of the institutions and the you know, sort of the, what they call an app experience is sort of like kind of uh, cringe, cringe worthy and that, but, but it's consumers still sort of put up with some of that for now, but when they understand that alternatives exist, that are going to just be light years ahead, then it's going to be harder going back to an earlier conversation for some of those institutions to compete in this space. And I think that you know, retail is, um, is going to evolve. And I think technology is helping make that happen and, and players that are really committed to building the solutions that consumers want. So, so I, I just stay tuned. I think the next, you know, three, five, 10 years, the landscape, certainly on the retail side is going to look a lot different. Yeah. It's an exciting time to be in the industry for sure. Absolutely. Colin, you've given us uh, a, a session chock-a-block full of wisdom and insights. And I know uh, I really appreciate it and the audience really appreciates it, I'm sure. And I just want to say personally, as a as a friend, 
I am absolutely cheering for you and Varro. But even objectively, I think anybody in the industry, and I know the challenges are steep, you know, the economic challenges and the current environment I know are steep, but I can see how your team uh, is inspired and why your customers are so engaged. And it's, uh, it's really motivating. So I wish you the best. And I thank you for joining our podcast. Thanks so much, Jody. It's been a pleasure. Thank you for joining another episode of Banking on Innovation. Make sure you subscribe to get future podcast episodes. Please follow us on LinkedIn and at personetics.com. Thank you.